Okay, so I am going to record it. It looks like we have a good showing. Everybody's sweating blood and deciding, ah, I've just got to figure out how to get my face there. <laughs> okay, so we have one student who is pregnant and not feeling good. So she is going to do both of her presentations first. Is that all right? Um, this is Mosa. And that's, that works for me. I was, again, very lucky. I was very young when I had my children and I was healthy and didn't have problems, but um, that's, that's unjust not suffering, <laughs> right? Unjust advantages. Um, so Mosa, go ahead. Okay, Professor, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to give a presentation on my research paper, who says the topic is perception on homosexuality of Bangladeshi people. Uh, you have to slow down. I cannot. Oh, okay, sorry, Professor. So today my topic is uh, perception on homosexuality of Bangladeshi people. So first of all, let me tell you uh, what is homo homosexuality mean. So, Basically, homosexuality refers to attraction between people who are the same sex, and it comes from the Greek word homos, which means the same, and it is a sexual orientation and opposed to a gender identity such as male, female, then, for example, LGBTQ. Uh, and according to statistics, I explained shown that same gender marriage has begun being uh, legalized in the 21st century, and now 20. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, uh, and globally, twenty-eight countries have legalized it so far. And then in this, uh, this so legalized, and then the, so and where Bangladesh is, you know, still is under, you know, um, even sorry, not accepting the homosexual uh, homosexual thing in Bangladesh. That's because Bangladesh is an Islamic country, and same gender marriage is against Islam. And according to Bangladesh Criminal Court, even, uh, you know, it, it's been saying that same gender marriage or sexual activity is illegal. But, you know, uh, it has not systematically applied yet because uh, the, act, the law actually inherited from British Indian government section 377, which is same sex sexual activity against the order of the nature. And also, uh, in my you know observation for my surroundings, for example, in, uh, I have seen many people around me who doesn't support this, and they use gay or lesbian as even abuse, uh, you know, abusive words. Even they can't, you know, they are not interested to listen the homosexual words. That's because they find it very abusive or this kind of thing. And even they hate the people who talk about, you know. Um, homosexual and then support this and who are in such this kind of relationship. And, and in Bangladesh, if someone is involved in this kind of relationship and then uh, he or she doesn't want to disclose it because they are afraid if, if and they are afraid because if society excites them and it happened because like uh, if they disclose the relationship then and uh, so what the society will do, they have, you know, they will keep them away from the society and then they have, you know, uh, so that's why they are afraid of that. And then even according to research, it's been shown that, you know, a good number of people in the, for example, like if I give my, oh, sorry, my, <clears throat> if I give from my personal experience, for example, from my Asian University for Women, I could find that, you know, uh, they, uh, everyone think that everyone has equal rights and freedom and we should accept them. So according to my institution students, so for, for example, one of my students from uh, one of my, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, professor. So one of my friends from, you know, India and other countries as well, they, they, they believe that so rights should be equal and then it's about feelings so they, they can marry the, who, whom they want, but it's not for everyone. And then in Bangladesh, it is expected that you, and you know, 
uh, as uh, day by day the situation being changed all around the world and also it expected that you know in bangladesh the uh, you know same gender marriage the view of same, same gender marriage will be uh, different um, from the past um, like from the previous generation as the education rate is increasing but you know religion affiliation negatively impact on public health opinions but about this concept particularly only in bangladesh whereas if, if you could say you know as i already mentioned in the first you know uh, you know uh, 28 countries have legalized it but even bangladesh is not you know under even you know negotiation on that okay it, this is the human rights and we can do something on that but and even uh, for example even we look at in india that's uh the section 377 it has been changed and then it's been saying that um uh, people who for example like same gender marriage could have taken place if they want and also professor like in bangladesh culture even uh, the culture play vital role you know and public attitudes about homosexual and <clears throat> because bangladesh is an islamic entity that mentioned and most of the people are muslim and then if we see the history of bangladesh then you will uh, find bangladesh is a mixed nation in present era society doesn't act on homosexual relationship and according to a research by adam sick uh, in 2009 and he found that cultural contracts affect most people attitude towards same gender marriage people behave as changes about same thing <clears throat> about same sex marriage is different countries but some countries but still bangladesh people don't even listen to talk about this because because the country itself and its culture and this has also found that religions play vital and then uh, explains people's behavior depending on a nation's culture cultural context in their research they classified bangladesh as a higher survivor and lower self-expression country they also added from the research that personal religion beliefs have highly impacted on public behavior towards, towards same gender marriage or homosexual relationship. And also, Professor, there are a lot of you know um, the <clears throat> research taking place. For example, you know, according to the Dhaka Tribune, which is a you know uh, known newspaper in Bangladesh, and the editor of this newspaper, um, he was talking about. And LGBT issues in Bangladesh, and and what found what is hey, you need that, to wrap it up, Osa. Yes, Professor, give me one minute. So what has happened that as I, the first time the editor has to talking about the LGBT rights, and then I uh, told that it has to be you know uh, implemented in Bangladesh, and the next day he was found you know dead by the people you know you know for example the islamic scholar a lot of people saying that these are these are the people are responsible so even you know professor the bangladeshi uh, uh government and uh, the section the you know the law says that man cannot be raped even a, a woman can be raped but man can can be raped so as a result the homosexual people are you know um being raped and then humanly and then harassed a lot of things happen in bangladesh Thank you, Bob. Okay. I, I'm so surprised how many people arrived in class. Like we haven't had this many probably ever. So it makes me a little suspicious. Um, but that means there isn't uh, a lot of time for questions or comments. So I'm just going to have to ask you to move on to your other part of your, your uh, outline for your final paper. Please excuse me, sorry. So now I'm going to give my outline presentation, which is I have selecting a topic from my readings, the Aristotle versus and biases. And from that, I have taken this a self control, generosity, and uh, sorry. Sorry. self control, generosity, and courage. Uh, that because, like, you know, according to Aristotle, uh, for example, the first verse in children have to be learned in temperance and self-control in relation to the pleasure human beings share with the other animals, especially the pleasure of the test and you know, task, the pleasure that comes from it, uh, eating and sex. So this verse of taking pleasure in moderation of the you know acquisition of material things. So the, <clears throat> this verse is cultivated in the, you know, uh, mostly in a household because a children in being based in uh, 
uh, in household from their you know childhood and the purpose of the household is to in uh, inhibited children in the virtues and to meet the basic needs for survival at the same time professor for example uh, like um another one is like too many children grow up with a uh, with either too much or too little, and this grow up in household with exist in material goods and with parents who accept their children to have as much more than they do motivated to acquire more than they need. So, and then this leading to you know animosity between the rich and poor, social inestability, in 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 and so, for example, like children who grow up with you know are too little are either you know. A fixed or survivor also, uh, or else less, uh, sorry, lose motivation to even try to move into the middle class. And then um, even you see the, for example, people who are uh, grow up with little and they can do in order to get their, you know, um, get, uh, get their pleasure. And then what they can do is they can even commit it, you know, crime. And also the people, uh, children who are growing up with too, too much, they're not, they're less motivated to, you know, um, uh, to uh, like acquire less in the future. So, and the generosity thing is that, I'm oh, sorry, the next part is like the courage the ability to accept appropriate in situation involving fear also you know is developed early in the childhood because children and vulnerable um, uh, this courage is really important because uh, in childhood uh, children uh, child um, ch children and vulnerable and get into fearful situation often in their childhood and then they have to learn to avoid unnecessary danger but also face dangerous that they can avoid so they have to be able to take risks when it is based and the the noble thing is to do the virtues also has a profound effect on the quality of social and political life also for example if um, citizens in uh, any country are afraid of physician pain they may doctors to you know invent medicine for all sorts of elements that they can caused by bad habits. And also, and the you know, final one is Professor Generosity, who means that, you know, in order to have people's oils, oils being giving away money or some other kind of, you know, materials, that is really important. So I'm really, you know, agree with this, uh, uh, with uh, Aristotle, that's because uh, in the current society, so if we show that instability and then recent poor, the gap between is, is, you know, really high. And then in order to, to get self-pleasure, are making um, self pleasure a lot of you know gender a lot of you know inequality have been raised in the society so in that case the narrative could play a you know big role to in in order to uh, you know re re reduce the gap between uh, you know decent um, poor and also the all being of the minute. society. Thank have you. Thank you. Done. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think yeah I'm I. Like we haven't had this many students for a long time. And so I'm only, people are gonna have to have 10 minutes each for both presentations. And um, I that's just the way it's gonna be, I guess. Um, so Mosa, I think if students could just say things like, um, I my paper was about, child raising and self-control, generosity, and courage. And I do think self-control is important. Example, kids can't be impulsive, right? Uh, just something where try to avoid reading your papers too much, getting too much in the particulars. Um, but anyway, so that's fine, Mosa. I just have to move on to the next person. Um, if I thought my attendance would be like this, I would have had you know the research papers on Sunday and the final papers today, but life goes on. Um, so Mosa, um, you can stay or you can go because um, you're probably pretty tired. Um, okay, so I guess I'll ask Pooja, she asked to present next, but uh, I, you know, in general, I, I can't just have the students in the chat asking me that. I'm gonna have to just, you know, choose things. But okay, Pooja, go ahead. Okay, 
Uh, all right, if you don't come on right away, I'll just move right on and I'll come back later. Um, so let's start with uh, now. Go ahead now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am not going to say two from Myanmar. I'm UG2, Rasa UG3. My topic, my research paper is the FAT of education in Myanmar. So for the first step, I would like to go to the... My introduction which is the value of education. Here is the value of education is our two men's strength about to live a good life. And we are human, we need education because education may people control ourselves and that culture our thinking to live with the right destination. It will say way to be a good leader. We also need education because without education, how can we lead the people? So we, we will be a bad leader without education. And then there is the last day is uh, about the effect of education in Myanmar, which make the country and develop and people are in a poverty situation with an disagree. And according to this, there I have two point of uh, the important education system, which I want to mention in the in our study, which is about uh, the importance of education by Aristotle. Here is he mentioned that human psyche need education because to have it, it is important to have education to override our surface stance and then to control ourselves. And then the other part is like investment of education. Here People said that uh, education is necessary for all the people because people allow this, this uh, education is necessary because without education, people will not know what is good or bad. They may have their own view and their perspective, which for their own selfishness. So, and the um, the importance of education in the other part in education keep the power of value. According to that, there I have two examples, which is monarchy system and democracy system. In monarchy system, they are they mentioned that most of the ruler family they should be the one who educate us to control the country or the society they are ruling. Without education, they will not be a good leader or a the one who can control the society. Be, uh, therefore, they show all the ruler family, they should be educated to keep their power to control the citizen. And the, for the democracy system, here is we have seen that all, all the people are have their own freedom. So in democracy system, people are free, freely to do what they want. Therefore, if there was no education, people will do whatever they want and we not look for each other and that we just do for their own benefit. But with education, people will know what is the right and the wrong to do between each other. And the other reason is they may know what is their right and then they can control their self and then they can control their freedom. If the leader or someone who did the wrong things to them, they can I guess back uh, those people. Sorry. Yes, and then the other part, the other example I choose the there was no right for women to get education. Okay, this is, this we your, already know. is this your final paper now? No, no, it's my research paper. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. You have, yeah, you have one more minute. Yeah, here is uh, the difference between who, women who have education and women who don't have education. Because in Afghanistan, the Afghanistan country, there are the, so many women were forced to marry, and there so many women have to allow this culture. But for the women who have education system, they can flee of this uh, force and then they get their own freedom. And 
the, for the bad education and bad governance in Myanmar. Here is the topic that I want to uh, talk more about is there was a last change in Myanmar after the Myanmar get freedom from the British colony. Uh, Myanmar Burmese military started to control and uh, take over power to control the system and that they change the education system, which is to a bad education system and that it make the country more poverty and that so, so many citizens were in a difficult situation to against them because people are uh, have no knowledge to do, even they have to be under the military control. Uh, they have no right to against this control because they just had to struggle with their living standard and it is uh, their time is going by that. So the other thing is the Fresh Air from NLD. NLD is the party who support the citizen. And it is, uh, they are, this party is coming in 2015 and then uh, like creating- okay, You really uh, have to know, you gotta. Yeah. You got to quit. I get, okay. Uh, they are the one who support the CDC and they change the education system and they, they make so many development in the country. But they are the effect of an educated leader, which is we know as the general who control uh, the Burmese military general who control the country. They are an educated people, so they look only for their own benefit and they want the all the people under their control and they do whatever they want so according to no uh, no education or no knowledge we have seen there is the difference between an nd and the Burmese general who make the country develop and undeveloped therefore education is the important in the people life to make uh, the society develop and make the people in a developed situation yeah okay yeah that's it's a really good thesis. It's a great idea. And it sounds like you've written a nice paper. I'm just, uh, again, uh, I have never had this many students and it makes me a bit suspicious, but we have to just keep moving. Um, Aurora, go ahead. Sure, Supti, that's fine. Supti is having, go ahead. Aurora? Can I give some time later? Oh, sure. Fala? Yes, Professor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, my topic for the presentation is humanistic psychology. So, humanistic psychology is a psychological perspective that emphasizes the study of an individual as a whole. It argues that uh, everyone should be treated differently based on their unique personality. Also, uh, it emphasizes the importance of being your true self in order to lead the most fulfilling life. Uh, for example, a humanistic approach to parenting would, in, uh, would include assisting children uh, in developing their abilities rather than forcing them to follow the crowd. Uh, also, humanist psychologists study human behavior, uh, not just from the perspective of the spectator, but also from the perspective of the individual conducting the action. More, moreover, unlike other uh, therapists, they believe that humans are not the product of the environment. Rather, they think that the person's behavior is governed by the uh, view of the world around them. So uh, this form of therapy encourages individuals to build a better life and a healthier sense of self. So uh, in the first part of my research paper, I'll discuss uh, some basic assumptions of humanistic therapy. And then I'll discuss how this therapy could be improved according to me. So humanistic psychology is based on the fundamental uh, assumption that humans are, sorry, humans are good and they have a free will. This indicates that an individual can make decisions that affect them and others. So those decisions carry with them a sense of responsibility. As a result, uh, uh, this method stresses people's ability to make reasonable choices. Also, this theory suggests that morality, ethical values, and good intentions are the driving forces for behavior, while uh, adverse social or psychological experiences can be attributed to deviations from these behaviors. Uh, also, it says that uh, humans have an innate drive for self-actualization. Uh, it helps a person to develop a healthier and stronger self sense of self. 
Uh, this therapy involves understanding your worldview and developing a sense of self-acceptance, which is accomplished by uh, developing unconditional positive regard for yourself. So in this therapy, there are two practice techniques. One of the practice techniques, uh, one of the practice technique is called client-centered therapy, which was uh, developed by Carl Rogers. Uh, so this therapy involves helping clients to explore their thoughts and feelings and to work out solutions to their problems. Uh, it focuses on the belief that a client is the expert on their thoughts, feelings, experiences, and issues, not the therapist. Also, uh, rather than providing a detailed explanation of the client's problems or blaming the client's current ideas and actions on previous events, the therapist listens to the clients and creates an atmosphere in which the clients make their own judgment. So it also implies that the therapist refrains from passing judgment on the client for whatever reason. Uh, so the absence of judgment in this, uh, in this profession is called unconditional positive regard for the client. Moreover, uh, this approach helps a client to become aware of aspects of themselves that they were previously oblivious to. So when the therapist reacts to those sentiments, uh, it pulls those aspects into focus. So the client is free to make decisions independently uh, without making the therapist the center of their thoughts. Another type of therapy is Gasol therapy. Uh, it recognizes that for forcing a person to change results in further distress. So it helps a person to become self-aware and accept and trust their feelings, which helps to reduce stress. Uh, so according to humanistic therapy, forcing a per person to change results in uh, stress. So this therapy doesn't help people to change their perspective. But uh, if a person st sticks to one perspective and doesn't want to change, he'll consider himself right even when he's not. So when the first client first came to the therapy, he had a perspective that he was incorrect because the uh, person was too self-deprecating. Uh, he underestimated himself. So according to the definition of this type of therapy, a successful therapist will lead a client to positive self-regard. However, the definition does not say a true self-assessment of the client's abilities and interests so that he can choose an appropriate professional path for uh, himself that will lead to a flourishing life. So uh, also the definition should include the client will be able to recognize healthy relationships, those where those involved, encourage and inspire each other to flourish. So uh, the client will be able to quickly recognize these kinds of toxic and harmful relationships that had been before that led to this problem. So the way it is defined, a successful therapist puts a person into a state of positive self-regard that is most likely to lead into delusions that he is right more than he is better than he is, which will never, him, uh, which will never help him for, uh, for in his growth. So instead, the goal should be to motivate a client to reflect upon his thoughts and think about whether he is right or wrong. So instead of deluding a person to believe that he is right, a therapist must help him to recognize the cause of his suffering. Uh, because if a person doesn't recognize the cause of his suffering, he'll never have a healthy psyche. Moreover, escaping from reality will not help in self-growth because uh, we ignore the cause of our suffering. It is the uh, same as relying on prayers where we can do something for ourselves. Therefore, uh, this uh, therapy is a tactic that doesn't help us. So this, the therapy should uh, help people to change their perspective and not to be deluded by this positive thinking. Because without this self-examination, those who have been wounded are likely to harm others in the same or similar ways because uh, this is all they know. Instead of being the one who was abused, they become the abuser. That's it, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, again, I would love to have conversations about this, but um, you can just, you can go contact people if you want to pursue it. Um, okay, Ashlyn. But Professor, I didn't present my final paper yet. Yeah, actually, we're going to try the one round and see how this goes, because, okay. um, well, how about you could give a, a couple minutes about your final paper? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so Ashlyn, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, hello, Professor. Good morning, everyone. So uh, when I actually saw the uh, stream 
of our Google Classroom, which uh, just gave a suggestion on us to write about the therapy. Like one of the suggestions that you have given is about the therapy for our research paper. What I actually thought is the root here um, is missing. I, I mean, myself, since I am using this class personally to learn a lot of things into my life, I thought something is missing for me to do a research in. That is why I uh, came up with my thesis or my research paper on the stigma that is existing about existing about the mental health and why people are being dragged back from consulting the therapy and um, consulting the therapists and taking therapy. So uh, that actually dragged me. Uh, that actually drove me. Uh, drove my attention to understand what kind of stigma, in particularly in my country and in my cultural context, is existing. Uh, that people uh, find it very difficult to treat their mental health issue. So um, I remember, I, I personally believe family and schools to be the building blocks of a child's personality and construction. But I don't, I don't necessarily or essentially remember teachers or my parents teaching me, if you are having a mental breakdown or an emotional uh, breakdown, you have to do this, you have to do that. But rather, if I am I am getting a hurt or I'm getting a wound or I'm having a fever, they are told, uh, they are telling me you have to take medicine, you have to tell your teacher or your parents. And without second thought, they'll be taking me to the hospital. So that actually, uh, in that point, I thought, um, so the emotional feelings or the things that I'm having inside my head is something that should not be considered for my lifetime. It's something I should I should bear with myself until my death. So that is that is where I had a I had no idea about what mental health is. So I found it very important to understand what mental health is. So when I looked into many researches done and when I looked into many data, I I found that. A human being is constituted not only of the physical health, but also of the mental health. So as, as much as we are giving importance to the physical health, mental health also should be given importance. For just imagine the situation if you are if you are if you are completely neglecting your emotional status and you are feeling unwell, that means you in, as a person totally you are feeling you're not feeling good. So that actually uh, made me think that mental health should be given the same importance that we are giving the other part of our life too. So, as most of the South Asian countries, mental health is given less importance in my cultural context. So uh, if I tell my parents or if I tell my teachers that I'm feeling something down or my parents would be taking me to religious institutions or to the priests telling that you have to pray, you, uh, it's it's everyone is facing this uh, facing similar situations if you pray to jesus everything is going to be fine so that was one of the things if i feel sad or if i feel happy i won't be sharing anything to anyone i'll be taken to the religious institution i'll be praying but when i understood that it is something that we need to share and it is something that we need we can share with a professional my view about mental health totally changed that is why i think people uh, the, the, that is why the people doesn't know much about therapy as well. It's because their misconception and their stigma related to the mental health is still prevailing and they are telling therapy is nothing. So I guess that thing should be changed first, the stigma and the misconception that people are having about mental health. That if you are getting a mental breakdown, it's just your problem, blaming yourself. So that concept must be changed. And th that is where, and if that particular thing has changed, misconception has changed, we, that is where we can introduce the therapy platform into them. So I guess then it will, it, it will be easy for people to go into a therapist. Normally, as we are going, in, uh, going to a physician for a fever and everything, once all the stigma and everything is, uh, is gone from the platform, we'll be like very open to tell others that, yeah, I'm consulting a therapist. I, I am getting, uh, I'm getting counseling. It's very normal for me to talk to the therapist. So that is, uh, that is why I took my research topic on the stigma and the importance of therapy and why therapy is not famous and why is it very 
negatively influenced to the people so that's actually my research paper it's simple but i feel it's very important to be understood and coming to the final paper which i will be writing is as i have um, already mentioned in the previous class how liberal arts education helped me in shaping the so called healthy psyche idea i got from the class so what i basically try to uh, include in my final research paper is i'll just have a comparative uh, comparative yeah comparison of my life before coming to aw and the education i perceived from my country um i will i will come up with all possible drawbacks that i got from the education that i had in my country and i i will come up with all possible uh, um, all possible advantages that i got from aw which offered the liberal uh, which which is a liberal arts education and what helped me in shaping myself and my ideas and my opinions so it's basically uh, yeah the final paper would basically be a comparative analysis of my life coming to a culture uh, to a uh, to an environment which helped me shaping myself to express myself so yeah that's it professor i really would like you know to give people time to react because i think how about if we have two comments then two people want to make any comment to ashlyn okay asia Professor, it's clap. Oh, it's clapping. <laughs> Actually, I should clap for everyone because all of them are interesting. Um, yeah, okay. So the other thing is this class is sort of like cheap shot humanistic therapy, right? <laughs> this is a generic cheap shot, you can't blame me version of, you know, what a human therapist might do right help you clarify stuff but you have to do it yourself sorry guys um <laughs> anyway so very good i just wish we could have time but um let's just keep going um amal what about you yeah can i share screen or yes i opened it up for that okay I think I did anyway. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Um, my research paper topic is uh, the growth of drug free treatment. Um, so uh, the reason that I chose to write about this trend is that um, like recently I've been watching um, a, ser a serial where they discussed about, uh, you know, depression and how uh, people who are, you know, taking meds for that, um, like, and they compared it with like how after how they uh, uh, went to therapy also like reflecting on my own country case where people um you know they're obsessed with uh, having medication for treating uh, mental uh, mental uh, uh, illnesses um so just a quick question um uh, like if hypothetically, if you if you were diagnosed with mental illness, what would you choose to uh, what do you choose to as a remedy, uh, like the medication or going for therapy and why? So you can just simply unmute and tell me. I was uh, so much into this. I'll go for a therapy. Uh, why? Uh, that that is why because therapy in. in can I tell? In the therapy field, that's my understanding. There are professionals who spent their life, long, like their career, in uh, shaping themselves to help others. So, uh, I guess that that particular thing is missing among the common people. But there are actually professional people who are capable of helping us. So that thought will drive me to therapy for therapists. Yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, anyone else was saying something? 
Um, That's me, so. Go ahead, yeah, Derek. Okay. Turns out so many side effects. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, so there is still ongoing debate on whether what is best, like the drug based, uh, uh, the drug based method or the therapy based method. Um, I think this um, this debate, uh, like reflecting on my own country, it arises from um, first the confusion of uh, professions. And second, uh, you know, the stigmatization of going to therapy. So people, they would rather take me uh, medicines to, uh, you know, to treat themselves. Uh, so uh, I covered in my paper about you know, cognitive behavior therapy that I emphasized most about. Then I just briefly discussed about mindfulness, meditation-based stress reduction, and traditional healers. Um, so uh, like for cognitive behavior therapy, I guess like this is very important because it helps us to um, uh, to you know, like have uh, your self realization of uh, our like what we are going through and our mental illness, um, and also like meditation based uh, stress reduction is also a way to uh, stay focused, uh, you know, in the present moment and realize you know what we are going through. Also, traditional healers are quite uh, prevalent in my country, so people sometimes. Um, uh, choose to go to some, uh, you know, that we call it like here, sheikh, uh, they do magic. Uh, this is like, in some communities it's prevalent, but like uh, uh, they, they believe that they, it can heal. Um, the advantage of, you know, the uh, drug-free uh, treatment is that uh, like people, they have uh, control of their feeling uh, to reduce the feeling of weakness uh, it reduces anxiety and it decreases uh, pain uh, level without having any side effects uh, so depression uh, is one of the most prevalent psychiatric disorder and it's treated you know by different ways um, there is antidepressant and there you know we, we can have a cognitive behavioral therapy for antidepressant, uh, it, like it's not that addictive, but you know it causes the adaptation of, to the to medicines. Uh, so if it's not euphoric enough, some people like just uh, double dose, and uh, also like it can be abused in some ways. Um, for like having cognitive behavioral therapy, it's important because the patient, you know, will identify their thoughts. Um, like about you know the past traumatic experiences they uh, they had uh, like also they validate their uh, beliefs and thoughts uh, it will help just to better understanding of the condition and being more self um, aware uh, so for the philosophies that I connected to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy um, and like and uh, uh, and like the me medication, uh, Aristotle would, I guess, go against um, uh, medication addiction, be like when we connected the virtue of temperance, uh, people uh, like, um, like it, it requires us to have a uh, unicorn, like, uh, you, you, uh, you know, like it requires us to have a uh, balance in, you know, taking doses or um, it's like having control of uh, the medicines we have. And for Seneca, when we look at uh, the letter that we had, it was like, it was very interesting, engaging and helpful. And it seems like you're talking, uh, like you're uh, learning from uh, a life coach or um, an individual therapist. Uh, I think that was, like this connects with uh, the like it was uh, cognitive psychology based uh, for uh, Augustine like Augustine view that mind should like reflect upon itself and um, like live accordingly to its nature so uh, it 
it encouraged like self attention and uh, uh, like and like having um, strategies to you know uh, associate with cognitive uh, therapy. So at the end, like what is best? I guess like it depends on the um, on the mental illness and the severe severity of it. Like having mixed method will be also okay um, rather than you know, sticking to one of them. Uh, I guess yeah, it depends on the uh, illness. And shall I go for the outline for my final paper? Sure. Yeah. So my, uh, uh, my, uh, my topic is similar to Ashlyn. Uh, it's about uh, how AEW helped me to um, have a healthy psych. So I will, I will discuss like four aspects like liberal arts, arts education and uh, healthy psych. Also, like I want to mention about the virtues that I learned, like the uh, uh, through AEW and, you know, uh, how I uh, adapted them within this very diverse uh, community. And also I will have a part talking about uh, secular humanism um, because like it's interesting how this institution gather many religions and uh, you know, uh, but still like it's, it's a secular, secular human, uh, humanist uh, institution. So I will say how this helped uh, towards healthy psych. Also, uh, I want to mention like how being liber liberal also helped me because it's uh, like I want to compare it with the uh, past uh, educational uh, system that I had and how like it was it wasn't liberal. Uh, it was it didn't help me at all to be like liberal uh, until I came to UW. I um, I started like. I, I want to mention like how the, these changes in my mind, like having liberal minds, uh, uh, helped me yeah to have a healthy psych. So that's my. Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, um, all right, new jot. Hello everyone. Hello professor. So I'm Nuchat and today I want to present my paper, uh, a research paper. The title of my research paper is Should Bangladesh, uh, Bangladeshis Abolish Their Culture of Beating Child? So this is a topic on which I really wanted to study and work on for a very long time but never got the opportunity. So I am really happy that I could write on this and research some things and got to learn more. So interestingly, did any one of you know that only 1% of the parents of Bangladesh believe that it's a violation of the rights of children to hit them without genuine cause? Like only 1%. Even though they think it's genuine, it's, gen it's okay if you beat them, uh, if uh, there is a cause. So the, sir, um, the numbers, the statistic is really dangerous. And we know the situation is extremely intense when researchers show that a total of 67% of surveyed parents encourage ch teachers to beat their ch children in school as the parents believe it is the only way of teaching discipline to children. Physically harming a child can lead to many long-term and psychological and emotional effects. Therefore, my paper explored on how hitting children turned into a culture in Bangladesh and uh, what are the psychological reasons that acts behind this for the parents to beat their children. And it also examined on the negative effects of the practice of child beating. Uh, here I question whether hitting is the only way to discipline a child or there are other effective and better ways which are proven to be good for making a child learn discipline and giving them a better life. So in my opinion, lack of education firstly, then critical thinking, lack of critical thinking, lack of social awareness and lack of ignorance are some of the main reasons behind parents considering this practice as an ideal way of parenting. 
the most hurtful fact is though bangladesh government made many recommendations from time to time in prohibiting any form of corporal punishment no effort was made to officially introduce any law abolishing all sorts of corporal punishment that means if a child is bitten if a child is bitten in in human way by any of the parent no legal uh, administration will be there there will be no help for the child uh, because it will be considered that the child uh, the parents are the legal guardian and they can do whatever they want to so some psychologies actually work behind the minds of parents when they hit their child though in most cases um, it's seen that the parents hit their child mindlessly um, there are times when parents of bangladesh actually hit their child considering it to be the best for them um in the cultural context of bangladesh people associate fear with respect and so parents try to be strict with their children so they fear them for them fearing someone means respecting someone when children fear their parents it's assumed that good values have been instilled in their child by their parents and we often hear things like the child will not grow up to be a good human being if not get beaten up or there is no other better medicine than beating for a child to learn behavior so these are really some hurtful comments with that i as a bangladeshi hear um now and then from my relatives from my neighbors from my family members so they even consider the punishment to be more intense and to be more painful so that um it teaches them and it it warns them to not commit the same mistake again but the thing is are these act are these even beneficial or are these even effective in any way the answer is no because all the researchers are showing that hitting a children child will never teach anything to the child but it will damage the self esteem and self confidence of the child because see if a child is doing something and we just don't say anything and just beat that child or slap that child very with a force that child will be terrified and it at that time when he or she is getting bitten up the mind actually is not working because the mind is filled with emotions and the child of the human brain is not that developed to process all that emotion that intense emotion so at that time actually the child is not being able to store any new information as a result um nothing is being learned by the child just fear is being developed in the mind of the child and because of that fear the child is not committing that same mistake again maybe but we all will never have all, we all will not have our parents always by our side our we uh, when we'll get adult we will have to live our own life we'll have to know what is right and what is wrong and this culture of beating the child is restricting the child from understanding what is good and what is bad and in that way after growing up that child that person adult person will have the whole freedom in front of that person without knowing how to deal with this freedom how to when which in which direction to go and how to live a life in a healthy way because always that person lived in an environment where it's filled with restrictions and there was this set of people who always you know bit her or bit him and and told that no you can't do this without any proper instructions so it's really important that we talk about this that we engage into discussions regarding child beating in bangladesh and how damaging it is for the child because The, as i told you before even if a child is getting bitten by their parent in an inhuman way nobody will come to rescue even maybe yeah so it's important for us yeah okay right so your research showed that bangladeshis think it's good and all the research shows it's bad right yeah okay. so you need education I agree. <laughs> okay, you want to do your final papers? Anything else you want to say about that? Uh, oh, we thought we are going to say it after we are done with the research paper. So, well, 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to lose track of who did and who didn't. So why don't you go for it, Nuchat? Okay, okay, sure. So um, I'm um, thinking of writing my final paper on what a healthy psyche is and uh, or something that is uh, that will bring me a healthy psyche will not bring another person their healthy psyche. So my focus will be on how to find out your way of um, maintaining healthy psyche. Um, there are researchers which are telling that uh, people have um, people will there are people who do not be uh, uh, do, will not be able to live a good life if they remain in monogamous relationships. It's it's it, in my cultural context it's never considered or in even in Western culture I guess it's considered uh, it's not considered to be a good thing. But there are actually people who um, came out as people who do not believe in monogamy. They think that their flourishment will get blocked if they live in monogamous relationship and they believe in polyamorous relationships and in that way they will flourish. And there are many couples um, who actually get married but they remain in open relationship because they know their nature and they know how they will flourish. And I will, so I am thinking of bringing some examples like this can, this will be one of my examples and there, I will give many other examples like how people actually a, uh, some of uh, some people's life can be focused totally on career and some people's life can be focused totally on bringing up children it doesn't matter what it is it nothing is right nothing is wrong when um as long as you are focusing on your morals and and and, and speaking of morality also what is moral and who to decide what is moral and what is immoral um i personally believe in the idea that um as long as you are not hurting someone and um not causing harm to anyone it's fine if it's only with you so i will focus on that um um and then i will write my paper so basically this is what is going on in my mind for now Okay. Um, yeah, I'd say open marriages, if you have kids, it's a lot more tricky because I do think kids need a lot of stability. <laughs> right? No, no, it's not, I'm not saying that those are connected. I'm just saying about examples. Suppose a, a, a person can have, uh, can go to a, a more flourishing life getting children or uh, focusing on children. And, uh, and also there can be people who can get a flourishing or more better life going to a career. No, no, that's, that's fine. fine. It's just if you decide to have kids, I think oh. you're going to have a stable relationship mm, yeah. because you got to provide for them uh no i know philosophers of open marriages and i just think the guy <laughs> always ends up on top <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a guy thing i think i'm kind of suspicious but okay isabel go ahead hi professor am i audible yes all right thank you thank you so much so uh, hello everyone i hope everyone is doing well and being healthy and physically and mental health so yeah today i'm going to present my paper uh, first research paper and the final paper outline so at first i will talk about my research paper which is uh, where i have written about uh, something related to psychology of drug addiction so my topic is uh, the negative effect of drug abuse on physical and mental health so um, as we all know that we and some of us we've already discussed about the drug abuse now so uh, taking drug abuse is not a good way of uh, how to heal our mental health so However, in our, in our uh, class discussion where we have already uh, discussed about it, so it's very interesting to discuss here as well. So at first, uh, I would like to talk about uh, what is actually uh, mean about drug, drug abuse. So according to uh, the Australian Government Department of Health, drugs are the substances that have the ability to modify humans 
um, psycho psychological and physical well-being. So, which means anytime people who are taking drugs for without uh, having consultation with the doctors, it will damage the brain and it will cause a lot of negative impacts in their lives. So um, in our class discussions, I, I can see that um, Mr. Dimaggio, well, he mentioned that um, taking drugs is gonna help to, uh, you know, develop our, our health actually. But for me, in my paper, I, I will um, call the opposite view of, uh, what Mr. DiMaggio have mentioned. So in my paper, I discussed uh, that uh, drugs abuse can, that drugs can lead to uh, the various of uh, range of physical and psychological health problems. So it's including um, loss of control and increasing our anxiety, aggressiveness, and the misuse of a drug, uh, drug can, can lead us to suffer from another infectious diseases in lives. Uh, when we use uh, like uh, sanitary unclean or needles that is not uh, safe. So that is why uh, drug is not a really good, uh, good solution to solve our problem whenever we fight, uh, face or we are men uh, mentally unhealthy. So in my paper first, I, I discuss about uh, certain people lose control as a consequences of uh, a chronic use of drug abuse. So in this part, I would like to discuss about like uh, people who are taking drugs most of the time and the research has shown that um, when they take drugs, they will, uh, at first they think that they will know how to control themselves or they, they will know how to uh, think that uh, I will stop if, if, I, I, if it already uh, makes me feel satisfied, but it actually affects our mind and it makes us to lose control of our mind. For example, I'm taking an example in my country, especially, um, actually we don't really have that in, in that problem in my country, but uh, some people who are actually staying uh, already out, outside of my country and they take drugs, but they cannot control themselves. And two of them are uh, actually now very famous with that. So they do not control themselves. And whenever people at another people who is like, they hate someone or they want to abuse, uh, even including the political leaders, if they want to, abuse them and they just go to both of them to, to give some instructions and then they, they just follow uh, whatever instructions that people are given to them and then they just uh, post any bad things about the people and with it through social media or YouTube and they make videos and posts about it and they don't even know uh, the consequences like the victims uh, who who think about it and they just do it. They just just they just lose their control of their minds. So this is the examples of uh, the effect of uh, taking drugs. And then another example uh, of the, I'm taking is uh, taking drugs is actually increased anxiety that we have. So at first, the reason many of the reasons that people are taking drugs is because they are actually mentally unhealthy and they are feeling anxiety and they think that taking drugs is going to help them to reduce the anxiety or making them feel better but actually it gives negative impacts and it actually add more uh feeling anxiety and feeling lonely and also it cannot help them to actually uh to sleep well and making them feel dizzy so these are the effects of uh, taking drugs, and then another another part is um, I, I'm discussing about um, taking drugs also can lead people to actually uh, increase the aggressive behavior that they have. Actually, it's not actually common in whenever people take drugs to be aggressive behavior, but some research show that 
if they are actually uh, in the past, if they are being very aggressive, so if they take they take drugs, it will actually uh, lead them to be more aggressive, and they can do a lot of uh, like fighting, especially in their house when they not they do not meet uh, whatever they need or desire. So I think this is about my research paper that I'm going to discuss. Okay, now you wanna do your final? Yes, sure, sure. Okay, I, I have one point about Damasio is that he definitely wouldn't say drugs will save people if they abuse the drugs. The thing is he didn't do anything to prevent abuse. He didn't explain how we have to make sure to keep this under avoid abuse. Does that make sense, Isabel? Sure, sure, Professor. Yeah, he would just say, well, I don't mean abusing it, but I would say you did nothing to prevent this. That's that's it. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Okay, so um, this time I'm going to present about my outline of the final paper. So in my final paper, I, I'm going to discuss my topic. It would be how can a person stay mentally strong? So it's about the way how we we find a way to to actually stay uh, mentally strong in every situation, especially. So, what is actually my, uh, mental health? So, mental health uh, is about including our emotion, emotional, psychological, and social well-being, and it affects how we think, feel, and act. So, it also helps to determine how we handle our stress and make choices in our lives. So in my paper, I'm going to discuss uh, the way, how can we stay mentally strong all the time whenever we face uh, difficulties. So there, in, in, uh, I will discuss about uh, exercise our mind. So whenever we want to like stay mentally, strong we can exercise our mind through uh some people Dep it depends on how we feel or happy to do something for example if i am happy to play guitar it will help me a lot for example if i feel not uh, mentally healthy i can play guitar or listen to the music or dancing this will this will help me to actually uh, exercise my mind to feel better again or I can learn some new skills, or maybe I can also uh, share the skills that I have to people and make them feel happy. When I make them feel happy, then I will also uh, feel happy or share whatever I, I have. So, and another, another part is uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, challenge ourselves. So to, to be mentally healthy, we can also challenge ourselves, for example, we have to be more open and take our time for our wellness. For example, uh, most of the time, like we are busy with different things and then we don't even look at ourselves and take care of ourselves, especially our mental health. So we have to challenge ourselves and take our time to, to you know, take care of ourselves as well and then accomplish something or goals that we want in our lives. Also, uh, we have to also practice like uh, particip participate more in something like discussions, for example, in the class, we can participate to, to share or maybe we can join other people to have conversations. This will, this will also help us to stay healthy. Okay. And yes, Professor? Go ahead, one more minute. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so another important thing is to, to stay mentally healthy is uh, get rid of ourselves of what, uh, of the word can't. Most of the time we say it like, I can't do this, I can't do that. So we have to get rid of it. Like we have to tell ourselves all the time that we can do it, we have to do it, we can do it. So stay like telling ourselves to, to that we can do it, it makes us feel more strong and happy. And also another important thing is be grateful. Like we have to be grateful with what we have. Most of the time we focus on the negative things. For example, like uh, we don't have 
enough money. So we think about, oh my God, I don't have enough money. So how can I stay mentally healthy? But we have to also look at ourselves, what, what, whatever we have already have. For example, um, we have um, some important parts that makes us happy. For example, we have bike or cars or laptop. This will, this will actually help us uh, to, to stay mentally healthy and appreciate with whatever we have instead of complaining all the time for you know something that is uh, not actually happen so yeah professor i i do think that aw students in spite of all the obstacles what they have is education right they have an opportunity um for education so Mm -hmm. if they could overcome i know they have a lot of obstacles to overcome but they always have this opportunity right and when people have opportunity and they can move themselves up a social ladder, that I think is an incredible foundation for, uh, you know, teaching yourself how to stay healthy, right? Because yeah. you have this opportunity. And I always just thought other people helped me so much to get, I really owe it, right? I want to respond to their, you know, their support their belief in me their whatever so i think you you know it's one thing to tell somebody who's a beggar but i think the aw students can tell each other right what they have is and a chance for education so okay asa asa is going to go next thanks isabel welcome professor can you hear me yeah, although it's a little bit soft, so talk loud. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about my research paper first. So um, for my research paper, I decided to relate between um, rational emotive behavior therapy and circumstantial depression. So after reading professor's response to Damasio's view, I became interested in uh finding any kind of therapeutic approach for any disorders so so i chose um rational emotive behavior therapy so it is um, a type of cognitive uh, behavioral therapy so rebt in short okay so rebt is an approach um like that's focus on helping people deal with irrational be- beliefs and learn how to manage their emotions so thoughts and behaviors in a healthier and more uh, realistic way. So in order to understand the impact of events and situations that people encounter throughout their life. So it's essential to look at the beliefs people hold about um, these experiences and the emotions that arise um, as a result of those beliefs. So. An important step in this process, I mean, in this therapeutic process is recognizing the underlying beliefs um, that lead to psychological distress. Um, let's say holding unyielding beliefs makes it impo- uh, sorry, almost impossible to respond to activating situations in a psychologically healthy way and rigid expectations of ourselves and others only lead to disappointment and regret and this therapeutic process um, is learning how to replace your irrational beliefs with healthier ones this process can be daunting and upsetting and it's normal to feel some discomfort or to worry about you have made a mistake and in addition to identifying and Yes, I mean, identifying irrational beliefs, therapists and um, like they also work together, therapists and patients work together to target the emotional responses that uh, accompany problematic thoughts. And this approach and this therapeutic approach is proved successful in students' resilience and also in sports psychology. And uh, this approach is effective to deal with depression, anxiety, and many other disorders. But while applying the therapeutic approach itself, people may feel situational depression, which is completely fine. 
and in another article showed um, showed that the light uh, sorry the bright side the bright side of having circumstantial uh, circumstantial depression i mean dealing with such depression teaches us uh, to understand the complexity of our lives so i i'm going to uh, write about actually i haven't written so i'm going to write about my research paper in this way and okay so now i'd like to talk about my final paper so my final paper is going to um like going to be focused on some points from the readings so okay so first point is our lifestyles getting simpler to complex uh, lifestyle day by day so in the era of complexity it is hard to take an action against all evil deeds by human law and like when human tries to apply the natural law it can be inaccurate though and we uh, like divine law and the eternal law is the only window to judge whatever the wrong things are happening so this is my first point and my second point is like um, augustine's view was more focused on the eternal justice which is very necessary to follow but for example in talking about someone who has been raped uh, should be able to go to court and uh, get the rapist convicted without being judged uh, and punished herself i collected it from the reading itself and like however it doesn't happen really so in augustine's view it was more like a calculation if anyone commit any sins uh, then they should be punished but since our societies are getting complicated over time as i said in my previous point so it is hard to uh, decide such judgments precisely and uh, my last point of the final paper is the being um, whose capacities of enjoyment are low has the greatest chance of having them fully satisfied and a highly endowed being will always feel that any happiness which can which he can look for as the world constitute it is imperfect so to achieve a healthy psyche we need to bear the imperfection surrounded by us and the imperfections lies within us so that's it oh good for you asia you kept it you know thanks uh i actually i would love to comment on all of these but i guess we're gonna have to just keep going um yeah, I think in the past, nobody even knew there was rape going on. So I guess that's better um, to know and deal with it. Um, all right, so where are we? Saida, are you there? Uh, okay. Um, uh, all right. So, well, why don't we wait, Saida? She doesn't want to get recorded. So I'll just wait on you, Saida, okay? Uh, Fardim? Um, can you hear me, Professor? Yep. Um, just going to share my screen. Um, is my screen visible? Yep. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so my paper is basically me criticizing positive psychology because um, because of the way it disregards or delegitimizes sexism. Uh, I mean, it really fails to factor in the struggles of or the reality around any marginalized groups in society. But I chose to focus on sexism in particular because I felt that I would not be able to adequately discuss several groups within the scope of this paper. So positive psychology, I mean, very simply put, it basically boils down to like self-control. So the theory is that uh, we are the ones who control our minds, control our positivity, and that leads to well-being. So it's sort of I mean, it's overly simplified uh, to say the to say the least. Uh, and so, sort of the context for this is uh, when this idea was conceived uh, by the scholars who uh, so the, the scholars who sort of 
um, started this. Uh, so they talk about it being like so th their view was that at the time psychology uh, only focused on uh, the people who were struggling, the people who were miserable, and they felt that that was only half the picture, and there needed to be more focus on increasing the well-being of people as well, and that would be a complete picture. Now, separately, that doesn't necessarily seem bad, but the issue is that the people, the scholars who uh, who sort of define this concept, they have, I mean, their understanding of how society works is so lacking that, I mean, it's it's kind of astounding uh, how, and it's, it, yeah. And the way, when they talk about positive psychology, the words they use and the concepts they use, like, you know, they talk about uh, things such as Aristotle's um, uh, definition of a well-lived life, and they talk about the concept of uh, eudaimonia. So all these things, like they really draw you in, and these concepts or words they use, I mean, it's really, it, it's quite convincing, honestly. And then on top of that, they to justify the uh, positive psychology, what they use is, so they sort of use uh, scientism, and it's they, the value they they placed on natural sciences is so high that like it kind of you know ignores a social con context completely and um, so the all their positive psychology theories are backed up by animal research biology uh, quantitative quantitative research methods and the way it is presented to people is like these are empirical facts these this is science this is the truth and it's irrational to question it or yeah it's just supposedly it's it's not questionable at all that's the way they frame it and then they use this science to um sort of support really problematic views such as they so what they preach is you know always look ahead don't look for problems in the past and present they they try to use like science as a support to say that there's no value in you know being caught up in the problems of the past or present you just be optimistic think about the future and yeah that's the way they say it and then they also talk about oppression as an opportunity for personal growth i mean and uh, they also use this um they they shame the negativity of people who have experienced institutionalized um inequality so these are all very problematic and these are supported i mean they use they do it in the name of science basically so uh well where to start but uh, for me there are many issues with positive psychology probably more than i mentioned here i mean definitely more than i mentioned here but i'm just gonna talk about the ones that uh, stuck out to me the most uh it's very strange to me that the way they ignore social context or social analysis is they try to, I mean, they the way they frame uh, talk about science as if it's like above everything else. And it just, it's like there's no recognition of the fact that they practice science within society and they practice it for the research, the results there are used for the people who live in the society. So it's like they can't really take science out of society, but then they don't want to consider society when they're making all these claims. And and there's such a disconnect between uh, the proponents of positive psychology and the lived experience of people from marginalized social groups. Um, it's like the sort of uh, what they say is that, you know, it's it's self-control, it's your own effort. And that is that basically defines your success or whatever you achieve in life. But it's like there is no realization of you know how privilege works. And someone from a marginalized community might have to work uh, two times, three times as hard as someone who has more privilege uh, than someone who has more privilege, but they still might not get, uh, get as far because of the way social structures work. But there's no recognition of that. It's just they put it simply to, you know, you you put in the effort, you uh, you practice self-control, and you get everything in life. And um, there is so, I mean, there is such an ignorance of the suffering of people who are marginalized. Like, and it's like so. Bringing it back to Seneca, I mean, 
as much as we might be inclined to, you know, escape suffering, we really can't. So denying it only creates more suffering. And uh, sort of the injustices that are faced by marginalized groups of people or like women in general. So that's unnecessary suffering. I mean, people can work to uh, remedy that. Uh, but there's just, you know, if you can't even accept that there is suffering in the first place, then you can't do anything about it. But that's sort of what positive psychology preaches, that everything's fine. I mean, it's it, everything will be fine if you think positive, that's their message. And um, but that human ignorance only creates more unnecessary suffering. And it's also like a new form of oppression because it it suppresses attention to social injustices and the way so when they say that you know the way they talk about negativity as if it's a failure uh failure of self-control but people who suffer people who are marginal marginalized their anger their sadness it is very much justified but they it's just their way of dismissing that completely and it's it, it comes down to the they make it boil down to if you're uh they make you feel guilty if you're negative, even though you have the right to be. So that's the way they suppress um, attention to social un injustices. And it's like, I mean, it's it's kind of funny when it's not sad that they talk about positive psychology as if it's this, you know, new wave of psychology which is going to, um, you know, really lead us to an amazing future. But what it really seems like is a regression because. Uh, it's ignoring everything that has happened in the past, all the lessons we should be learning, all the movements that have happened to uh, for society to progress. And it just completely, I mean, dismisses it all. So it really feels like a regression. Um, that's it about my research paper. Okay. Uh, okay. So for my final paper, my final paper is about spiritual humanism and its potential to be the foundation for a healthy psyche. Um, so when I wrote the first paper for uh, about a healthy psyche, it was very much, it was more personalized and very specific to my healthy psyche. I wrote a letter to myself for this. I wanted to explore um, what could be a more general way of approaching healthy psyche, maybe if not for everyone, maybe for more people. And um, so first of all, like I wouldn't define the health of a psyche based on like temporary states of the mind. I think that a healthy psyche comes from the way of life we choose. Uh, I would say that the health of a psyche is determined by how well it enables someone to pursue growth, seek out knowledge and wisdom, and flourish in their public and private lives by figuring out what is most meaningful to, meaningful to them and then pursuing that. So my idea of the my idea of the kind of philosophy that guides the kind of life I describe is like best represented by ancient ideas really. And what I talk about in my paper is Aristotle's virtues and Seneca Seneca's views on suffering. So I won't get uh, too much into detail because there isn't time. And especially for Aristotle's virtues, I feel like we've discussed it a lot in class. But the way I, uh, well, one of the ways I approached it was, I appreciate the way I understand that not it's not uh, all the virtues are not quite applicable in the same way to different societies because of cultural differences. But I think there is a real value in you know finding the mean between two extremes and then leaving it up to people to uh, think about those decisions and take responsibility for finding. Um, the best way to live their life and the, the way it encourages um, self-reflection and critical thinking i think there's a lot of value in that even if it doesn't give any uh, direct i mean it is sort of ambiguous so it doesn't directly say you live your life like this but i think that's a very helpful tool and i think what aristotle's virtues uh something that it does is it it can help us envision a better future a better version of ourselves by uh, sort of thinking about these virtues and how it makes sense to us and then um, sort of trying to live up to it. And then I talk about Seneca's uh, views on suffering because it's, I mean, it's 
this part is really important to me. I mean, the Aristotle's virtues is as well, but I think at least in my life, I've experienced people, we all suffer, that's just inescapable, but the way people process that suffering, it, I mean, it can, if people don't process it uh, the way they have to, then it really becomes detrimental to them and the people around them. So how Seneca talks about necessary and necessary suffering, and it's, it's really meaningful to me because um, it is very important, a very important personal uh, part of a healthy psyche is uh, acknowledging when we are suffering and then you know, processing it. And then especially for, I mean, for necessary suffering and also for unnecessary suffering, there are things that we can do to reduce that if not eliminate it. And the first part of that is being able to acknowledge and process it. So to me, that's very important. And I, I talk about that in my paper and I, so these ideas combined are what I refer to as spiritual humanism. To me, they sort of complement each other and they're not too overly simplistic. They embrace the complexities of life. And um, okay, so I also uh, talk about how spiritual humanism um, can help us create a society where we can unite reason and faith and build more well-integrated communities where people with different worldviews have a better understanding of or more respect for each other because of the common ground they share. Uh, individuals who are more well-adjusted, uh, you know, make more uh, make more adjusted communities, and this in turn supports further personal growth. So I, what I like, one of the things I like about uh, spiritual humanism is that it doesn't um, dismiss the value of um, the value that people see in religion and then uh, our metaphysical contemplation. So it doesn't isolate them. And it also doesn't endorse just one religious faith in particular. So it doesn't isolate people who, uh, who have different religious faiths or people who don't have a religious faith at all. So it, what it does, it gives people uh, common ground such as, you know, we all suffer and then the virtues are maybe not all of them are relatable in the same way, but I think that people do connect to it, uh, many of them, because uh, because just of, of the way it generally appeals to the human condition. So I think that common ground is really important because um, if when we have uh, like an us versus them mentality, it doesn't really help because people aren't, I mean, that's how you know, extreme, extremism um, sort of grows and thrives because we can't, people aren't really receptive to um, people who think that they don't have anything in common with or that they're against them. So when people feel more connected and feel more trust in their community, they, they can, you know, people can hold each other accountable more and they can uh, have more productive conversations around their differences. This is not meant to, um, not meant to ignore the uh, differences that people have in worldviews or not meant to sort of confine everyone to the same worldview, but rather try to work productively around our differences rather than, um, yeah, rather than have that cause uh, a lot, a lot of issues that, you know, uh, that's the way it re usually goes when there's a lot of div division. Um, so, I mean, I talked about that in a lot more detail, but uh, I'm trying to summarize it right now. And um, okay, so that's basically the gist of it. Um, I just, I talked about um, a very basic level of, um, a, a basic level of, you know, creating a healthy psyche by uh, incorporating Seneca's views on su suffering and Aristotle's virtue into our, uh, like as individuals and then using that to create healthier communities. And to me, uh, I feel like those are very, uh, so using that, it can enable us to create uh, more complex versions or, because uh, you know, we are all different and what a healthy psyche is to someone does differ. But to me, this is something that people can connect on that and they can use it to create their own versions of a healthy psyche so that it helps them in their life. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That's it, Professor. Okay, very good. Uh, again, I'm so sorry, we can't stop and talk about it. 
Um, but yeah, I'm I'm listening. I hope all of you are impressed with what each other does. Uh, Ratika, are you there? Yes, Professor. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Professor. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm here to talk about my research paper and I will give you a brief idea about my research paper. So my research topic is cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders. So what is cognitive behavioral therapy and eating disorders? So cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of psychological treatment and the most common therapy which focuses on changing the thoughts that can contribute to psychological problems, including eating disorders. And eating disorder is a kind of psychological problem that causes unhealthy eating habits. So I have discussed two possibilities about this therapy in my paper. Uh, first one is that some people might not believe in this kind of therapies. This is because somehow people in my society do not consider psychological problems as an important matter to be treated. And also we have certain ideas and thoughts about particular things, but this therapy tries to change those thoughts. And second one is that uh, it might not work for everyone uh, because there are different types of eating disorders and each of them have different symptoms, uh, which requires different treatments. And another reason can be money, because sometimes people need to attend more sessions than usual because of their complications, which can cost more. And at the end, I found that the combination of treatment, which is therapy and medication might be more effective. Uh, so that's it, Professor, for my research paper. Okay, and I do want to say one thing, is that yeah, I do think somebody's got to include that sugar is an addiction and white flour, and that isn't just your thoughts. I mean, literally, you think about wanting to eat because the sugar level, you know, I mean, I just stopped eating a lot of those foods and I just don't get hungry that much. So I, you know, I do think they ought to combine it with a diet that doesn't make, get you to think about eating a lot. So anyway, I mean, you can consider that. You're not gonna find that in your research, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but yeah, I read a whole book called The Hacking of the American Mind. And the whole thing is about how addictive sugar and its offshoots are written by a doctor and he's just like he's like a fundamentalist preacher he's just on his soapbox he just every chapter is and sugar is the problem <laughs> anyway so go ahead Ritika that's fine yeah yeah for my final paper like uh, my final paper will be about healthy psyche and I will give my point of view about that by addressing things from my class material and those are about flourishing the goal of human life is to flourish in any situation and another one is pain and pleasure that uh, everyone seeks happiness and associate associate that with pleasure whereas everyone avoids unhappiness and associate that with pain and the last one is about humanism because I really do believe in humanism that it can help many people. And I think I will write about secular humanism in my paper. Okay. All right, good. Um, again, I'd love to press that further, but uh, so with Fardin and Ritika then, I mean, you could go with that chapter on positive psychology, Glenn Hedges, and just say they actually use Aristotle. And so you could use it as an example of how Aristotle gets abused by, and, and you know, it has a serious impact when you misread Aristotle. 
which most uh, philosophers do, because they don't realize Aristotle's talking about Greek tragedy and Homer, that's his whole culture, which is all about all the awful things people do in the name of the good. But anyway, I got to quit. Um, Masoma, you want to go? Thanks, Ritika. Uh, yes, Professor, thank you very much. Uh... Am I audible, Professor? Because yes. I get the message that my internet is unstable. Okay. Oh, everything's good. Okay, thank you, Professor. So, uh, yeah, I make a slide so may I can share. Uh, so yeah, uh, today my topic is about my research topic is about mental health issues uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so. People might, you might wonder that, you know, why I choose this topic, uh, because we were supposed to write about the types of tropics uh, available in our countries. And then uh, actually this is a very terrible issue. That's why I want to address this uh, and write uh, a research paper on this. And then because uh, of the lack of research on the mental health issues, we even do not have any data about the type of tropics that we have available in the country. So, um, Historically, or generally speaking, mental health issues are underestimated and uh, not, uh, I mean, globally, not in the developing countries, but also in the developed countries. And uh, so uh, I think Ashlyn was also uh, addressing to this point that, uh, you know, uh, people give more value to the health rather than, than mental health issues, because, uh, uh, for instance, like they give more, uh, you know, importance to the uh, physical well-being to like a disease like cancer or diabetes, but then they do not think about mental health issues that we have. And then, uh, yeah, when it comes to Afghanistan, unfortunately, uh, you, you might know or you might be aware that, you know, Afghanistan or uh, Afghan people uh, has been facing, you know, civil war or an armed conflict for more than, uh, uh, you know, for decades or more than 40, more than, than 40 years. And then uh, it's highly possible that, you know, people might face mental health issues. I think this is kind of uh, self evidence because uh, research also shows that all the countries that, you know, experience aggression, violation and armed conflict, the people obviously will face some mental health issues. But then despite the, the high prevalence of mental health issues in Afghanistan, Afghan government lack of professional and systematic mental health care or mental health support. But then uh, this is not only the case, but what really offend and, and, and is depressing, uh, you know, when you hear that mental health or Ministry of Public Health and National uh, Mental Health Strategy, they are keep saying and emphasizing that, you know, mental health issues are improved in Afghanistan. Uh, we improved a lot, uh, you know, uh, but then uh, the issue, I mean, uh, it's not like about how much we improved, but then uh, the issue is that they keep emphasizing that we improved and showing the people that you know this is not a very serious issue but then the data that they are providing is completely contradict with the other uh, you know uh, international organization and other research that uh, are uh, conducted in this on this in this issue so uh, research like you know world uh, sorry other research and world health organization human rights watch uh, uh, reports are different from what uh, Ministry of Public Health uh, okay. in Afghanistan. Okay, so Nasoma, if you have nine slides, this would take 20 minutes. So, you know, you, you decide what you want to say. It's great, but it's going to take way longer than we have. So go ahead. Yeah, okay, Professor, I will be short. And then uh, despite this all issues, another issue is that, you know, uh, uh, mental health is stigmatized in Afghanistan. So even if you have very less uh, mental health supports and mental health care, but then people would not even get those uh, 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 health and treatment to, you know, uh, to approach to psychologists or psychiatry to, to get uh, help or seek help. Uh, so, therefore, in this paper, my thesis was that I will explain mental health uh, issues in Afghanistan, that is a terrible issue, and then uh, it's uh, more likely to remain uh, uh, as it is. 
uh, and to, it will not be addressed in the near future because uh, given all this uh, other issues and factors. And uh, before uh, like going to my main point, I wanted to, you know, uh, first of all, emphasize on the importance importance of this issue and why mental health is very important why should uh, we preference it so according to world health organization they define health as a state of complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely uh, the absence of disease so we we see that you know health generally is related to the mental health so there is no health without uh, mental health so if a person is you know uh, mentally uh, well so they can prefer their you know, uh, perform their uh, individual duty in a very uh, productive way. But then, uh, <clears throat> but then people give less value to this issue, not only in Afghanistan, but uh, generally speaking to even in developed countries, still this is an issue. But then, yeah, the issue, this is a, a more terrible and serious issue in Afghanistan. And also the other research shows that, you know, there is a, um, um, a relation between mental health and the economic development, not the economic development only, but and then I think that there is, you know, in other uh, sectors like uh, social well-being and all of this are related to the mental health. So, uh, yeah, this is kind of, I think, uh, self-evident. So, you know, that if a person is in a good mental health state, then obviously they will, uh, you know, uh, perform their duty is in a more productive way. So I think this is very uh, serious issue that we should uh, take it serious. And uh, so mental health is strategy and mental health system in Afghanistan. This is what mental health uh, Ministry of uh, Public Health report that, you know, mental health uh, is improved a lot in Afghanistan because mental health is also among the first priorities since 2005. And they also- Donna, You're going to run out of time. So please pace yourself. Okay, Professor, so the, uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, uh, Ministry of Public Health uh, in Afghanistan are keep saying that we improved a lot. There is this much hospital for the, you know, for the people. You can just, with you the, can just move with on, you know, people have read the data. So keep moving. I, I want you to be able to present, but I, it's just not going to work unless you just got to keep moving here. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. And then it's okay, Professor. And then uh, what World Health Organization is saying is completely uh, contradictory with uh, the, uh, with uh, uh, the Ministry of Public Health uh, uh, claims. So here, yeah, they are saying that there is no legis uh, there is legislation actually in the mental health uh, for the mental health issues in Afghanistan, but no budget is allocated in the sector. And you know, there there national wide there is only three hundred twenty hospital beds. So it's not talking about the centers or hospital. But then it's talking about the bait. But then if we go to the data that what uh, Ministry of Afghanistan is saying, they are saying that, you know, we have, I mean, the amount of hospital and centers are uh, uh, around 2000, but then the bait are 320. This is completely contradictory. And you can see that uh, the issue yeah. here uh, and also human rights watch uh, also reported the same thing as uh, they are saying that you know there is very less budget uh, allocated in the mental health sectors uh, and this is you know way more uh, less than what world health organization said that it should be allocated in the in the sector and the developing countries and also in the countries like afghanistan that suffer from the violations and uh, despite all these issues there is a stigma around mental health issues that people you know do, do not approach to psychologists research uh, also pointed out uh, this that you know people think that if you uh, mental health issue is is something that cannot be solved if, if you uh, if you have mental health issues it means that you are someone like you know uh, crazy like you are not you know an, a normal person so uh, my uh, so to conclude, I I say that given all these issues, uh, uh, despite that we, uh, there is a high prevalence for mental health issues, and then the lack of sufficient system program, and then the stigmatization around the mental health issues, and also the false claim of the Minister of Public Health, uh, uh, you know, um, make it very difficult to to solve or to address these issues in Afghanistan in the uh, near future. So yeah, I think. Okay, thanks. I, I mean, that's really good, Masoma. Um, I just 
Yeah, I'm sorry that it's so quick, but the other so thing is, so how about your final, just a couple minutes for your final. Uh, okay, uh, so professor, uh, for my final, uh, I wanted to, yeah, since it's about our healthy, I mean, our definition of healthy psyche, I wanted to write uh, uh, to get help from the theories that we discussed in the class, like Aristotle, Kant, Mel, and Augustine's theory, particularly. So uh, considering uh, all those theory, I will define that what is a healthy psyche, and uh, uh, why these theories are important uh, to take consider. I, I mean, despite that, you know, some parts are weak and then we can reject some parts, but then it doesn't mean that we shouldn't ignore all the theory. Uh, so I think uh, in com a combination of all this theory is, you know, important. So I think, yeah, in my final paper, I will talk about the advantage and disadvantage of these theories. And uh, I will particularly add the switch part of theory is more, you know, a, a good uh, and plausible uh, theory and healthy for our healthy psyche to accept. Yeah, okay. The other thing is that um, none of the theories, I don't, I mean, that taking the theory from the point of view of a woman, you're going to apply it differently, but it's more true, right? because when privileged white men did it, it corresponded less to the truth. So um, now that women and, and minorities and um, people in a less privileged class are able to take the theory, they should be listened to in the application rather than the privileged white guys, like the positive psychologists. Um, so if any of you want to include that when you're talking about classical humanism, that it really has to incorporate. Um, I think Fardine was saying that. So if any of you wants to walk away for 10 minutes or something, that's fine. We have an hour and 10 minutes and we have, I think, five more students. So I, I am going to be pushing you for 10 minutes. Uh, I hope you, you feel or you think I've been fairly fair uh, when people did screen share, I couldn't keep track of the time. I don't have a clock. So um, anyway, I hope I hope you think I gave it my best faith effort. Uh, Pooja was asking before, and then when I called on her, she was <laughs> her offline. So Pooja, you want to go? Okay, she's not there. Yes, Prof. Oh, Pooja's there. Sorry. Okay, good. Yes, Professor, I was waiting for long. Go ahead. Should I start now? Yes. Go. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. A very good morning to you all. So today I'll be I'll be surfacely describing about the research paper that I am writing on. So it is like it, the topic of my research paper is cultural clinical psychology in Nepal with the philosophical views on soul and psychology to contemporary world today. To begin with, uh, I have a question for you all, like why most of the people still believe in cultural practice and its form of treatment to treat any mental disorder rather than believing in a clinical psychological treatment system. So if you have any answers for now, you can just type in the uh, chat box. So moving to that, uh, I'll be, writing my paper on the research that I have done on this topic, connecting it with like Aristotle on soul and psychology and to contemporary thinkers today, along with Naomi So's uh, book on how the of human life is flourished by the decision-making and is manipulated by culture. So to answer, the first question that I have asked to you all, I think the reason behind not believing in treatment system, the clinical psychology is, is because of the stigma, awareness, lack of trained human resources and mental health services, uh, rough train and less government priority, which have been the barriers for the developing uh, this sector especially. So it's, uh, it's still in, 2000, uh, in 2022, one, uh, there is a lot of stigma. Be, uh, and because of that, many peoples in Hilly area of Nepal believe that if we consult to the psychiatrist, 
for the treatment they are considered mad in the society which is why they don't want to go and treat the disorders that they have it is this statement is based on the research that i have included in my uh, paper so why uh, the rate of uh, mental illness is like so high is because a belief in traditional healers a lot uh, and lack of awareness knowledge and serious belief i think if i see like why people even uh, being cultural form of treatment or like they are believe traditional healer much is that they don't have the other other believing in like uh, because of the situation they are having and the double option they have to is traditional way of treatment and i see if i connect it with like the oh dear okay from dn to the given to that switch Pooja, you're you're out. Can't hear you. Um, okay, Pooja, um, where are you? Whoops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. I think we're just going to have to move on. And Pooja, you can come. Sorry, Professor. Can I, can I, can I? I mean, the network got. Okay, Pooja's back for a minute. Pooja's back, and then Aurora can go now. I just finished the way. Uh, so, where I was that uh, using practical wisdom in the situation they have been through using the Aristotle devices. So moving on that, uh, majority of people in Nepal believe that uh, the mental disorders are in the relationship between supernatural influences and lack of knowledge uh, about the mental illness among the patients. So presenting a story based on my home, which I have mentioned many times like in the classes, is that uh, my grandpa is 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 a local healer, and I think um, I personally think that he is using his therapeutic power for the motivation and therapies. It has become his identity now, and people value his moral virtues and ability to attract his therapies that he follows. It might not have the ideal ideal standards in today's world, but he might not be following the required intervention as like other psychotherapists does but he is practicing and motivating to follow his moral ethics and his knowledge that he's gathered from many years and people believe in that I, and which is why this is one of the reason why many people still believe in the traditional healers a lot uh, and if we see it from biomedical perspective that i have i have included in my title i think uh, in nepal the the cost for medical treatment is a lot. And then uh, however psychiatrists or doctors uh, take their psychotherapy in a more systematic way, but uh, still uh, in Nepal, what have been like more perceived is like traditional healers are more cheap and they can be like taken anywhere. There are a lot of local leaders in every society and it is an easier method for their primary treatment, treatment. That is why I guess a lot of people are like into the uh, cultural form of treatment in Nepal. So moving to that about my final paper. So what I have thought about this is like, since this course has been one of the course where I have written a lot of posts about healthy psyche each day after the class. So my, what I am thinking is like, 
writing a paper where I can actually uh, realized or perceived after going through all the writings of post after each class and understand what healthy side psyche mean to me after each class and realizing does it really apply to my daily life activities so i think i'll be writing uh, i'll be reviewing my all the posts that I have written in the class and i will try to realize and understand what actually a healthy psyche mean to me after going through all the theories for example like aristotle vices where it means like where i have written is that happiness is the ultimate goal of everyone and and in the second post about augustine what where i have written like how how what's the importance of eternal and temporal uh vices and how uh, raising a children and internal culture international culture is mixed up with that and for example thomas aquinas where and the natural law theory marking luther's kings i mean like i want to review all the kind of posts and write about what i have understood understood throughout the course and what actually how can i actually apply all the theories and uh, the things that i have written in my post i really want to work on that and i want to write i don't know it might be a proper way or not to write my final paper but i really want to i mean like apply this all theories and write a final paper in my as a last paper of my class for this philosophical course thank you professor this is sure. what i want to discuss today okay so puja it's fine if you're motivated um uh let's see sure puja it'd be great to do that don't don't blow your mind don't end up in mentally totally broken down by it but <laughs> if it's helpful do it uh i'd love to read it and i will um okay aurora go hello everyone hi i'm aurora today i'm going to give a presentation about my topic which is women uh, psychology towards sex. Uh, I wanted to highlight here the thinking phenomena of sex. Sex is still devil in Bangladesh. Many girls think it is right for their husband to do whatever he wants to make him come. Sometimes men uses excessive force to make his pulsar without the purpose, proper knowledge of the female body and feeling. They often ignore the fact that what she wants and that makes the sudden feeling of sex and bringing a new life to this beautiful earth a scary dream for a girl. Lack of sex education in Bangladesh made the situation worse both physically and psychologically. Regularly, females get teased by males in street about their different body parts, natural things like periods too. Some situation goes too far to get raped by a male. Even sometimes this experience comes from loved ones and leads to death. Uh, we all may hear the story of Dihan and Anushka. I'm talking about the Bangladeshi people. Like it recently uh, happened a thing. Uh, Anushka Nur Amin, who was his uh, who was 17 years old and O-level student of Mastermind School in Dhanmanji was sexually assaulted and killed on January 7 by her boyfriend named Ferdin Iftikhar Dihan. Last year, also 1,627 women became a victim of rape. 53 of them were killed after rape and 40 of the victims took their own lives, according to Ayn Shalish Kendra. The actual number is believed to be higher as many victims choose not to report assaults, fearing their safety. This part unfortunate experience made sexuality a nightmare for women and as found no one to trust and discuss as well as don't know how to deal with the situation they become vulnerable to the sexuality and hide them in tears so i want to convey a message through this my research paper that 
sex education should be provided in Bangladesh, not only in Bangladesh, but also in the countries where there is no sex education system. As a result, the negativity about sex will be removed and the idea of leading a kind of healthy sex life will be formed. So now I'm moving to my uh, final paper outline. So the thesis statement of my final paper is there are many different ways to build a healthy psyche but an interesting way to do this is to build a healthy psyche through a philosophy which many surprise which may surprise many Aristotle's virtues and vices Augustine's confession humanism and Hage's empire of illusion drive us towards a healthy psyche as well as humans should accept more ideas about the healthy psyche from philosophical thinking. So, it is very easy to understand from the thesis statement that here I will write how can we get or build a healthy psyche through philosophical thinking. So, my first paragraph will be based on Aristotle's virtues and vices that how can we get a healthy psyche through Aristotle's virtues. I'll describe some of the virtues of Aristotle and highlight it how they are related to the healthy psyche, like uh, how generosity, rational pride, truthfulness can drive towards a healthy psyche. My second paragraph will be based on Augustine confession. Mainly Augustine wants to say to have a good relationship with God in order to be happy. The role of God for positive perception in human life is imminent. And this positivity drives the human towards a healthy psyche. I'll describe about how to get a good relationship with God and uh, this uh, will towards a healthy psyche. My third paragraph will be based on humanism. Humans believe that this way of life is more fruitful when it leads to deeper and more lasting satisfaction than a spontaneous transmission of pleasure. So here I'll show how can we build our psyche healthy through humanism. And my last paragraph will be based on Hedges' empire of illusion. In his article, Hayes describes how people are becoming fooled by positive psychology tools. So here I'll show how one, how to get rid of these things to build a healthy psyche. Yeah, that's it. Thanks everyone. Very good, Aurora. All right, so there were more than one of you that got annoyed by positive psychology. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm with you, because again, it's mostly privileged white guys that would buy into that. Um, all right, so Diana, are you there? Yes, Professor, I'm here. Ahead, Thank you ahead. so much. I was wetting and wetting yeah, and no finally got the chance. Okay, so I at first I would go for um, for summary of my second paper and then go for the outline of my final paper. My title for second paper was that uh, does stigma increase child and adolescent mental health in Afghanistan? And uh, as we all know, Afghanistan situation is not good. So because of uh, a very long uh, time of war, a civil war in Afghanistan caused mental illness a lot. And it becomes a very hot topic in Afghanistan. And actually majority of the people are suffering from mental illness. And stigma is a big issue in Afghanistan and majority of them are not consulting uh, for their mental illness. And uh, another half of uh, Afghan population is not accepting mental illness. And if they are accepting mental illness, then they will go for cultural or religious treatment rather than going for therapist, uh, psychotherapist or psychologist. So based on the uh, research, which is uh, done in the few years back, and it shows that out of three children, two is having traumatic stress. And the caregiver mental health are trying to figure out that how many adults are having mental illness and they are suffering. And even there are, there are uh, 
young generation that even they are they didn't know that they are suffering or they are having mental illness because they don't have the knowledge to understand and uh, mental illness is a very rare very un hot topic among the afghan in the community because they don't have idea what is mental health in this what is the significance of it and what is the importance of it and um, the main uh, mental the uh, mental health disorder are this uh, distressing medical mm -hmm. treatment domestic and community violence and war related events which cause mental illness in afghanistan and there is a, a, a there is five mental illness that uh, people are suffering the first one is mental disorder second one is emotional distress the third one is post traumatic stress and the fourth one is depression and the fifth one in, uh, the fifth one is anxiety and um, still mental health is not being treated in afghanistan and um, psychiatrists is somehow become uh, not become really common but people are become aware of it and they are trying to go for the psychiatrist to to get medicine but actually they are not consulting psychologists as they really need of because a lots of uh, uh, distressing medical treatments violence uh, war related events they have affect the mental health of afghanistan people but people are not getting it or they are not accepting because of the stigma as well and because of the culture because of the religion uh, restriction they have accept that there is no mental illness or if they accept again they will not go for a treatment an outline for my uh, final paper i have chosen about the health what is healthy psyche and according to my belief i think that meant uh, healthy psyche is the balance of mental and emotional state of a person and this can allow a person to be productive during their day to contribute meaningfully to the community that they are living in and when this balance is getting disturbed and the then it will be a very difficult to the person that they can function uh, positively to be productive that's why i'm focusing on the men on the eight rules that i'm practicing every day and um, the first one is that at first every single person needs to value yourself and secondly to take care of yourself physically and mentally it is very important that a person can take care and focus on their mental and for their mental health and physically because it is really important because of their body function and mental uh, functioning and uh, it is very important for a person to surround yourself with a good people for uh, to positive people because we are engaged with the community whether we want or whether we don't want we are surrounded with people so it's better if we can cover uh, ourselves with good people and positive another point is to help others it it gives positive uh, positivity to the uh, to ourselves that we can be positive to be productive to make good things in our life and that can bring uh, to have a healthy psyche and um, learn uh, a person needs to learn how to deal with the stress because nobody is having a very smooth life there is ups and downs but the person needs to understand their self that in uh, in which level i need to uh, deal with this stress for example i can, i need to understand myself that if i have a lots of stress in the final of the semester so how can i deal with it how can i stay stable how can i stay productive how can i i can stay against my mental health to not to be depressed not to be an anxiety not to be disappointed and not to go in a negative way to save my mental health uh, healthy psyche and um, every single person needs to have realistic goals this is very important though from outside it's not looking important but internally it is really important because every person needs to go uh, based on a schedule based on their goals that they can achieve and that can bring changes to them and that can manage their mental um, mental health so the realistic goals can help the person to be real in life and to have uh, 
uh, healthy psyche because if their goal is not realistic, then it can cause a loss of disorder because they are trying, trying a lot and not getting their goal. So they are getting disappointed and a lot of mental illness can cause. And then we, every person needs to stay positive, to stay productive, to have fun, to be focused. It is every per, every single person's right to have. But the be, the the point is that every person need to to uh, note this and to practice it every day. That then they can have a healthy psyche. And the last point that I have every time I'm doing it, whenever uh, I feel disappoint whether I, in every day, I need to pray that I can stay healthy. I uh, might be, it is a kind of belief, but I have practiced it because every person needs to believe on something to have somebody to talk with. So I have recognized it and I have um, made it that I need to talk with my God every day. And he is helping me a lot and I can have a healthy psyche on it. And I will focus on the, uh, reference of from our class that meant the healthy psyche is not to disturb anybody not to harm somebody so if you follow these rules and not to uh, to do something negative then the life will be healthy so uh, it is really important to uh, practice it and um, make it real in our life to bring a healthy psyche thank you so much professor Okay, um, let's everybody applaud everybody. I think we're done. Um, but actually, I it's only 20 after 11. I'm afraid I cut some of you off too soon. Khadija appeared and disappeared. So that was going to be another 10 minutes. But so what I want you to do is each of you can ask one question or make one comment um about some things one of your fellow sisters said and um oh no i have one more that's right saida wanted to do it but not recorded so i'll turn off the recording for a second and she'll do it and the rest of you can think about okay i have one or two comments to my other sisters um questions or shout out or whatever um, okay, and then, okay, Saida, go ahead. Um, all right, so everybody makes one comment. You can uh, ask someone a question or do a shout out. And then you also, if you want to, second point, what was the most uh, surprising thing you learned or the most, you know, expansive thing, the thing that you had no idea you would get exposed to, and now it's sort of become part of your life. Um, so possibility of two comments if you want, but mostly just, you know, the first one is responding to something another one of your AUW sisters said. So Ashlyn, have you got something? Yeah, she's not there. Um, Phallic. Uh, no, you don't have anything? No. Oh, okay. Uh, no, okay. Isabel. Professor, um, I, I don't have anything to say, Professor. Okay, so there was nothing anybody else said that sort of impressed you or or anything, nothing you want to ask. Okay, that's uh, too bad. Uh, Saida, sure, Diana, go ahead. Sorry for interruption. I just really like the title of Ashnin, and it is. I was I was not thinking about India that is still stigma is people is having uh, or going through stigma and um, I, that was a kind of surprise for me because I just thought before that India is is developing and they are working on mental health because I have seen a lots of workshops a lots of uh, social media treatments 
so that's uh, i was thinking like people are getting better but when i listened to ashlyn's presentation so that was a kind of surprise for me and i like the presentation presentation of ml as well of who amal yes the okay. title and the way that she present about her data okay good very good um anybody else want to <laughs> speak before i put put you on the spot um fardine do you have any comment about what someone else said um there were so many interesting points made by everyone i sort of remember little things everyone said but i don't have one specific comment uh i'm sorry professor it's just everything is in my head right now there were so many interesting points made Okay, now, actually, now, did I cut you off before you had a chance to do your final? I think I did. So you can talk about your final. Are you there? Uh, oh, yes, Professor. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't talked my final apply yet. Go ahead. Yes, there is my final online. I am going to like uh, wait to, I I have make a little online. Yeah. Here's uh, I'm going to write about the different perspective of people taking a handy sagi. So far, introduction for my thesis statement. Um, I make a sentence which a handy sagi comes from different swing according to human perspective, but the main reasons for me is to be educated for ourselves, to control our mind and to care so we can have a healthy life. For my body part, I take a, uh, which is the perspective for Aristotle. Uh, as, uh, it is almost similar as my research paper for this part. And the other part is about the people believing in religion. It is also like, like some people, they believe in religion and they get a healthy psyche from God like that. Yeah. And the other part is like human character for the religious belief. Here is, uh, I mentioned the two difference between uh, some people who gain a healthy psyche from religion and some people who uh, get uh, effects by the religion like they get and have this like yeah i would just read like uh how can we give uh have this like depending on our view according to the our education yeah just that okay good um i think i'll go back over um auw's mission statement just to you know sort of think it through, you know, everybody just sort of glasses over when they when they're exposed to these things. Of course, this is what I take seriously. But let's just, um, you know, just process it for a minute. Um, highly motivated and effective professionals, leaders, service centered citizens of the region uh, promote the development of an intercultural understanding among the people of Asia. So, you know, when someone's structuring an institution, um, there's lots of flaws and there's lots of uh, human error, but I, obviously this was the mission when they started it and went to the donors to get money. And, um, you know, it's it's a high bar, which means you'll have a complicated life. But you like to see yourself as part of this whole historical move, right? To move women into positions they've never been in, which means you're going to have a life <laughs> unlike the people. You know, you're not going to be able to live by custom and habit. You're going to have to be constantly thinking. Um, and you, 
you know, even men who, well, men uh, whose fathers also were professionals and whatever, they don't have as much psychic work to do to get there. They're just basically imitating. They might think, I know a lot of guys that think they're really different from their dads, but they're not. <laughs> within this context of white male privilege, developed country, you know, whole lot of other stuff they don't even think about, but they think about the one thing that they disagree with their father on or something like that. So every, you know, every layer of new culture, you know, every breakthrough in culture that you're engaged in is psychologically harder for you. But if you keep the mission in mind, right? Um, I think I think that helps. It. I don't want uh, AUW students to feel guilty if they fall back or whatever. Um, I myself gave it up for my kids uh, for a while, so I wouldn't want to. Um, you know, I don't think that I would judge any choices you make because I wouldn't. Um, to provide a, a vibrant and diverse residential learn, learning community, right? So they can, um, can grow intellectually and personally. So you know that, that that's true when you can get there. Uh, create a student-focused learning environment. The humanities and natural and social science provide a broad base of inquiry. Disciplinary and independent studies provide learning depth. Applied studies in the general and majors curricula require them to link theoretical understanding with contemporary issues and challenges. So, you know, I hope that's what you think you're getting at at AUW, and I hope that's what you think you got from my class. Um, intellectual abilities, reflective growth, leadership, and service oriented. So, um, it's a lot and um, don't think like you can't do everything at once, right? So just, it's a good vision. It's a good plan for the future. You're not gonna achieve everything all at once. And then my particular program, which I brought into this was um, the Union of Reason and Faith and science, right? Integrating all those disciplines. And then the characteristics of a liberally educated adult, which I think are perfectly consistent. The thing about AUW, they don't mention religion, you know? <laughs> and I think that's because it's too fraught. Um, but I think, I don't think a lot of courses were taught where students get a chance to examine their religious backgrounds. And um, so that's really important for me to provide that um, because so many students just leave that, you know, that's not school, but then that like their psyches become so internally divided or conflicted or marginalized. So, <clears throat> I do think uh, it's important. And on the other hand, and the other thing about me, which I can't control, um, when I was in third grade, right, I decided God wasn't a person. And when I was in sixth grade, my dad is preaching this sermon and I decide I don't want to ever tell anybody what to think or what to do, but I do want to do I do want people to take this stuff seriously. So that's just the way I was wired. It's nothing I can really control, but I do have a conviction. I didn't want anybody telling me what to think, right? So, um, so I like to see students, you know, independent women thinkers. And I know some of you have gotten super anxious about my class because, you know, what are we supposed to do? I say, I don't know, because I don't know what's on your mind. I don't know what you think. And um, I know that can be really anxiety producing, uh, but I did have office hours. So I, you know, you could always come and, and ask. And I just feel like 
by the time you graduate, you don't want to have checked off a checklist of having done everything every professor wanted you to do every class, but you like, <laughs> there's nothing else there, right? What do I want? Who am I? What do I think? And so, you know, there's definitely classes that are trying to help you step back so that by the time you graduate, I know who I am. I know what I want. I know my sense of mission, at least for now, I can keep an open mind. I can grow in that mission. But I have, you know, I have some empowerment. I have a sense of myself and what I want, right? What matters to me, because it's also something I can help other people with. But the next thing, of course, is how many semesters are we still going to be away from campus? But I think that the, what you need to think about with that is developing resilience, right? Someday, someone interviewing you or in some informal setting at a job or at grad school, that you're gonna, they're gonna know you had these tremendous obstacles and they're you know, gonna ask you, how did you get over that? And just you know, try to plan to have a good story about that, right? Um, you know, you could say it's natural when it first happened, I was panicked, I was depressed, I was horrified. And I gradually, you know, gave myself strength. And, um, you know, it might get if there's another semester where you're still at home, you might think of other things you can do. Because now you sort of know the rhythm of this. And you know, you know, how to do this and find some ways like some students are connecting with old friends or some students are doing some sort of volunteering, uh, tutoring kids. Like there's lots of stuff you can do. I have one student who showed me her CV because I was recommending her for something. And my gosh, the stuff she's done since COVID, right? She's gotten herself translating stuff and once you start to do that, you, you know, you get into a network and other opportunities arise. That was clear. You know, she did one thing and that connected to another thing. And so I think instead of wondering, are we going to be able to get on campus? Think if we can't, I'm going to do something like that, right? I'm going to just say I've got this rhythm down. Don't think about I'm not happy about it. Think about I know how to do it and I want to do something else because I don't want to get stuck in a rut. Does that make sense, Amal? Does that make I think you did some stuff like that, right? Yes. Yeah. And you, you can encourage each other too, right? I mean, I'm not a person to talk to because I have too much privilege. But, you know, you can identify with the other students and talk to each other about, okay, how did, what are you gonna add to your plate? You know, that's satisfying to you and the other student can decide, would I like to do that? But once you, if you pick something that really fits with you, with what you want, what you like, that'll be connected to something else because there's this whole world out there online. But if you decide to go to social media and talk about how stressed you are, it just feeds on itself, right? It literally validates that the stress chemistry kicks in and you get more validation and you get, you know, the mutual complainers society or something. So, I mean, you don't want to go there. <laughs> um, but it's, it's all up to you to make a judgment call about how much you can handle at any one time. Um, but I just wish you well. And I, I, you know, I hope I've been, it's been hard for me to figure out, you know, how to make these adjustments. And I hope most of you, uh, it seems like you've responded. I basically decided I'm gonna let the students pace themselves, decide for themselves what they think, when to get the papers in,
because I just can't handle all these exceptions to the rule. Um, and I, I hope that it's okay that I just trusted you to just be grownups about it. Um, but I will have office hours. I don't have them tomorrow because I have my other class doing the same thing. But after that, until August 1st, and then I have to absolutely cut myself off from everything and just read papers because all the grades are due the fifth. And then my other class ends on the fourth and all those grades are due on the sixth. So I'm just gonna camp out for a few days, but I do not consider that stress because it's just a lot of work. That's very different than, um, you know, really not knowing if you're gonna get bombed tomorrow. You know, I mean, you're in situations where you don't know and you can't control, right? So that's very different from just having a lot of work to do. And I do think you ought to you ought to make that distinction in your mind too, you know, to say I just have a lot to do is very different than I'm stressed. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, so that's it. We got done twenty minutes early, and um, I realized it it was a long one. But take care, um, and I'll stay here if you have questions. Goodbye, Professor. Have a good bye day. Bye. Goodbye, bye, Dan. Professor. Bye, Professor. Bye, bye. It was really nice that I have your class. Oh, thanks, I learned Aurora. a lot. Yes, this Professor, great, we will Aurora. miss you and always. I appreciate all my classmates. You, I mean, really I nice. hope you bonded with your classmates too. That's, um, yeah. that's really important that I try to create community. I'm actually taking an online class about a, a woman who studied the Greek goddesses and I wrote a book where I used her book a lot. But the reason I liked her class, she said, she said, the reason I like this network is because you have breakout sessions and that gives women a chance to bond with other women. In other words, she just saw herself as a facilitator for other women to meet and then maybe find their soulmate, you know, or the person that they can connect with. And so that's really important to me, you know, that I just make it possible for other people to connect at a deeper level and move forward. Um, but I, I like all your stories and I tell my kids and I tell, I'm always talking about my students to, <laughs> to my family and my grandkids, you know, they're kind of, I, you know, I say this, I have a student in Afghanistan and she doesn't know if they're going to shut the, and they're just kind of, <laughs> so that's good for them to know there's a big world out there. Um, so. Yeah, and Professor, one thing for sure, I will disturb you to my mail. <laughs> Yeah, how'd I say? You'll disturb me what? I'll disturb you to mail, like I'll give you mail. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. You'll email me once in a while. Yeah. I'm not on social media, but you can check yeah. in with me once in a while. I just okay. want one on one, you know, somebody who bothers to, um, oh, that's nice, Ms. Soma. Um, you know, if someone wants to talk to me, I'm available, but I don't like that social media. It's just generic. I mean, you end up worrying about your brand, you know, you're presenting yourself. I just, I don't want that. <laughs> oh, good. So Fardine, thank you to my classmates. Um, that's good, you know. Um, all right, so when you guys get back on campus, you're going to have to find each other, right? Um, and I don't know. I, yeah, I don't think they're going back are they, in the fall, right? There's no time at this point. I don't know. Don't, don't quote me on that. But um, anyway, we'll see what happens.
Yeah, Professor. Bye bye and take care. Yeah, you too. Bye bye, Professor. Thank you so much for bye. everything for this great course. Well, thanks, Ms. Soma. I liked what you said. And new chat. Oh my gosh, beating your children. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor, for always encourage me. I'm lucky to have you. Yeah. Well, now I just, it's so amazing. And, and yes. the thing about education, of course, that's my thing. That's how I got into this business. Um, but I just had a good teacher. You know, that's what got me going. Yes, Professor, you are. Okay, professor. Bye. Bye bye now. Thank bye. you so much, professor, for always helping us out. I I have actually bothered you with my mails a lot of times, but every time you reply to my mails and the in the very beginning when the classes started, I was very overwhelmed because this is my first time with any philosophy or psychology related course, and I was like, oh my god, will I be able to pull this up? Um, but I, the documents, the, the materials, whenever I read and wrote, it really helped me to reflect back on my understanding. And it, this is one of the courses which, you know, would have an impact on me. Um, this, this is a course in, uh, which will I remember and the type of discussions we had, it will have an impact on me and it actually created an impact and i'm so happy that i took this course well new chat you have to promise me new chat that for the rest of your life to your little nephew and maybe niece your nephew yeah you yeah. Will, will be that weird aunt, okay you'll be <laughs> that aunt that's out of the box and you know doesn't yell at them or whatever tries to be positive and Get them to want to do what's good. But mostly you're just going to be that strange, educated aunt. And just stick with it. You know? <laughs> I crazy. love that kid. New Chat was just talking, you know, her paper's on beating kids, but it was, she has this nephew and yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Like, really. Well, everybody's different. I mean, Isabel would bring examples that were so different from, I mean, I just like finding out how people think. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, professor, thank you so much. For time. I, I really like the way you teach and your, I mean, the way you understand the students' situations. It's so, especially so cool and helpful for us, especially. And it's actually, yeah, I enjoy the class so much. Well, you just keep being independent thinkers, okay, guys? Yeah. Don't let somebody else tell you who you are, what you can do. There'll be plenty of people that will try, that's for sure. Yeah. So thank you so much, Professor. You have a good night. Yeah, I will. Who else? Bye, Professor. I hope to Bye. meet you someday on campus. Yes, yes. one of these years. Okay, I'm gonna go. I have to make another one hour video for my other class. Bye, Professor. Bye, professor. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye bye. It's midnight and I have another hour thing to do. So um so I think I will go.